coming up on Pet Heroes. A rancher depends upon her two dogs after a deadly attack leaves her fighting for her life. And a sales manager, blind since birth, relies upon his guide dog to lead him to safety after a terrorist attack. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. Working dogs play an important role, whether you're in the country or in the city. But how do these dogs react when their masters are faced with life-threatening dangers on the job? Glenda and Gary Mosier own a ranch near Barhead, Alberta, where they raise purebred Angus cattle. I love it here. Uh, tremendous community spirit, nice small town atmosphere, safe. Look at the mushroom. <laughs> Look at that. Missy and Scooter are two dogs. They live here with us. Scooter's the boss dog, and Missy is a little more submissive, so they, they get along really well. Scooter is what you call an Australian cattle dog or blue healer. A healer's called a healer because of its action of nipping at the heels of, of uh, livestock. And uh, they were perfected uh, for that function of, of working with, with cattle specifically. And uh, I believe there's some dingo blood and two other breeds involved in the, in the breeding of them. He was supposed to be Gary's dog, but he ended up being mine. <laughs> I like his faithfulness. I th he, he would just do anything for me. Missy's more timid. She's uh, very, very smart as well. Missy loves to run. Um, it's nothing for her to do 30 or 40 miles an hour, and her speed is unbelievable. And uh, any chance she gets to go out there and work with the cattle, she's first out. Missy's a different breed, and uh, Border Coley, which I think everybody affiliates with sheep. but. Um, we found her to be excellent with cattle. Missy likes to have everybody contained in a group. If there's a straggler, whether it's uh, uh, cattle or people, everybody's got to be in a group or she's very upset. They just made a tremendous uh, team for working cattle. Uh, Scooter heals them, Missy keeps them moving, and you couldn't ask for a better combination. The Mosier's daughter, Anna, son-in-law, Gilbert, and grandson, Travis, live on the ranch in a camper while a permanent home is being readied. To alleviate their cramped conditions, Travis stays with his grandparents every weekend. Missy and Scooter are always happy to have him. Their relationship with the family is just great. Travis plays with them a lot. Scooter and Missy are very friendly and they're loyal. In March 2010, the Mosiers are not only taking care of their own herd, but a neighbor's as well. We were looking after 58 head of commercial cattle for a friend of ours and custom feeding them for him. Mrs. Scooter, come and get it. March 27th begins as just another typical day on the Mosier Ranch. Oh, it had rained earlier, kind of a chilly day. Nice day, but you know, fresh spring day. Our grandson was up with us because it was a Saturday. Pancakes and coffee and worked around the house. Gary makes sure to check on his herd and the cattle he's tending to for his friend. They're across the fence from each other, but we don't want them mixed up with their own. Ours were being fed differently than um, the uh, other person's cattle, so we had to keep them separated for that reason. Then, just after dinner, Glenda notices something out in the field. Their neighbor's cow, along with two calves, have somehow breached the fence and found themselves in the Mosier herd. Said to my husband, there's one of our friend's cows and two calves in, the, in the, with our herd. Um, we better get out there and get her out. I thought, well, gee, I guess we better separate her. She's trying to get back, and I didn't want her breaking fences so that the herd's mixed together. For disease control and monitoring our own animals, we don't want any animals mixed up with their own. Well, my husband uh, went ahead of my grandson and I in our, in our gator, 
to open a gate ahead of the cow in the direction in which she was walking. So we just walked through that old barn building there, past those shelters, and came up over this hill. My husband went way past us in the, in the uh, gator to open these gates, and his intention was to walk back and help us move this cow through the gates. So Travis and I were coming, and everything was going good. She was walking peacefully along. Yeah, come on, that's it. My grand grandson and myself and my two dogs walked behind the cow, sort of patting our legs to make a noise so that she would go keep going forward to the gate so we could put her back out with the herd where she came from. The dogs were right beside me. My grandson was um, probably 15 or 20 feet to the, my right, and my husband was straight ahead of me, um, maybe 50 feet. One calf went through the fence, the other calf continued up towards the gate. In an instant, the evening takes a sudden turn. She had no history of being violent or whatever, so there was no reason for her to do anything different other than to follow her calf. I guess that cow decided to turn and just charge for the first thing she saw, who was Glenda. She's about to discover just how vicious a cow can be. She just stopped right here. And turned and just eyed eyed me and I eyed eyed her and I said, don't even think about it. But she did. Bam. I really didn't have time to experience any fear. I have totally no recollection of what happened. But Gary, too far away to help his wife, witnesses every horrifying moment. Coming up, Scooter and Missy are faced with the ultimate test of loyalty, as they must decide what to do in order to save Glenda's life. Walking a neighbor's cow and calves back to their herd, Glenda Mosier suddenly finds herself under attack. Knocked her down and rolled her four times. There was nothing I could do to intervene. Of course, this happened in split seconds. And usually a cow on an attack will do its thing and take off. But she just seemed to be persisting and wanted to kill, literally. But before the cow's attack can turn fatal, Scooter and Missy swing into action and begin barking and nipping at the cow. <laughs> Wendy McClellan, a doctor of veterinary medicine, offers her unique perspective on animal behavior. Working farm dogs are unique in that they're always on the job. They are paying so close attention when they're out there with the cattle, it's no surprise to me that they reacted immediately when that cow turned on Glenda. Grandma! dogs basically uh, he's realized what was happening and realized this cow wasn't going to give up and they better get involved because their beloved mistress was getting worked over. Scooter nipped her in the nose because usually goes for the feet but that was the closest point to him and the missy bit her in the leg. And then they both scared it off with his, their barking and um, like running at, at the cow and just stopping suddenly or just curving off to the left or right. She probably realized in her cow brain that these dogs meant business. She uh, turned away from Glenda, went back up the fence line and just walked right through the gate where she was supposed to be. And her calf had already gone through the, the gate. After uh, Scooter and Missy scared the cow away, I ran to my grandma and held her hand and told, told her that everything was gonna be all right. I saw one of her legs was crossed over and I figured, well, it'd be easy enough for her to have a broken leg, that's for certain. I could see her jaw was broken right away and uh, I said, we gotta get some help here. So I sent Travis down uh, to get his mom and dad. It was a little bit muddy at, in places for him to get down and through and close gates so our cows wouldn't get out. Scooter and Missy keep a close watch over Glenda, making sure she's safe while Gary looks over her wounds. Well, I continued examining uh, Glenda and trying to talk to her, keep her awake. 
and try and assess if there was anything else she could identify for me, but she was in such excruciating pain. Travis soon returns with his mother, Anna, who has already phoned for help. Ambulances are dispatched from two municipalities, but the ranch is 30 minutes away from either of them. And Anna by that time was at her mother's side and holding her and talking with her and we covered her with another blanket we had and just trying to keep her calm. And when they arrive, Deep mud prevents the vehicles from reaching the victim. Instead, Travis has to transport the paramedics with the gator. What we did is we worked as a team, the four of us, and uh, proceeded to uh, log roll her on uh, while someone was stabilizing her neck. We actually had put a collar on. We rolled her, we checked her back. After we checked her back, we put her onto the board. And once she's on the board, we uh, put on spider straps, they're called, that secure her to the board and then we secure her head so that we prevent further injury to her neck or back. The dogs stayed close to us. Dogs are normally protective of their owners, and I've seen that through other previous calls we've done. Then we discussed uh, how we were gonna get her out of there, and um, they said, well, have you got a four-wheel drive? I said, we sure do, and uh, that was brought down. And Well, we put her in the back of uh, my truck, and we came up to the ambulance, uh, which was here by the house. Uh, they immediately loaded her up. So their decision was to go to Meyerthorpe because that was the closest x-ray and the closest doctor available. Glenda remembers nothing about the attack, but her injuries include broken ribs, broken jaw and teeth, and a fractured skull. Plastic surgeons perform restorative surgery and all agree it's a miracle that Glenda survived. The way that cow was going, I don't think she was going to give up on her actions, and uh, she wouldn't have quit until there was a trampled mass of blood and tissue under her feet, literally. My grandma and grandpa, they didn't have Scooter and Missy. My grandma might not be here right now. These dogs probably saved Mrs. Mosier's life, and most definitely. Missy and Scooter end up saving Glenda's life for two main reasons. One is their expert herding ability, which is their job. The second is the bond they formed with Glenda that keeps them close by her, paying close attention to her. With so much time spent together with the ranchers, they can become just like another member of the family. The combination kept Glenda alive. We did not know why the cow did what it did, but we found out later that the cow had been chased around in a pasture in it. With, by an automobile and had been actually chased through the fence. And uh, by the time we got out there, she was probably still mad from being chased around with a car. Though the incident will haunt the Mosier family forever, it has also brought them closer together. And Scooter and Missy have reaped the benefits of their heroism. I don't buy dog food for them anymore. I make it out of cow hamburger. <laughs> Fresh vegetables and rice. There's nothing too good for my doggies. So uh, it gives me some pleasure to, uh, to make it for them. My dogs saved my life. And I will do everything in my power to give them life and a good life, best I can. I think they did it because they loved me and they wanted to protect me. The dogs knew I was in trouble and I think would give their lives for me. I believe that. Coming up on Pet Heroes, after a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, Will a guide dog be able to lead his visually impaired owner to safety? We just saw how two farm dogs were able to use their natural herding skills to save a life. Now we take a look at how a highly trained seeing eye dog helps a man escape disaster. Come on, God. 
Michael Hinkson of Nevada, California, is a renowned public speaker who has traveled the globe. Blind since birth, he has used guide dogs steadily for over 40 years. Guide Dogs for the Blind is the school from which I've received all of my guide dogs. Roselle was number five. She was 20 months old when I got her. Oh, it felt right with Roselle from the very beginning. If I gave Roselle a command, she would execute it, unless there was a reason not to. If she did something I didn't expect, I needed to go with the flow. Guide dog is a very specific job. They have the job to lead a person from point A to point B in a straight line, to stop for any changes in elevation, such as curbs or steps or an open manhole, for example, and to avoid distractions and to disobey. If someone gives a command or a request that would put the team in harm's way. The training that goes into service dogs is so extensive and disciplined that few animals make the cut. Good girl, you can do it. Good girl. As regional sales manager for a Fortune 500 computer firm, Michael and Roselle travel each day from their home in New Jersey to work on the 78th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. On the morning of September 11, 2001, Michael and a co-worker welcome guests to their office. At 8.46 a.m., as Michael and David make final preparations for their presentation, disaster strikes. Suddenly, we heard kind of a muffled explosion, the building shuddered, and then it began to tip. And you could just hear the building kind of groaning a little bit as it continued to tip and tip. I had a dog sitting next to me who was not in any way reacting like she felt in danger. David then released his hold on my desk and turned and looked out the window and started yelling, oh my God, there's fire and smoke above us. Mike, there's fire and smoke and there are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside our window. And I said, David, slow down. We gotta get our guests out and then we're gonna leave. It is essential for seeing eye dogs to remain calm and wait for direction just as Roselle did for Michael in this case. Michael's co-worker directs their guests to the stairs, and they do one final sweep of the office before leaving. And we didn't dare allow panic to, to happen because we would have been trampled and other people wouldn't have made it down. It would have just not been a good thing. We had to focus and get down. If the dog had bolted, Michael would have been stranded. If Michael had panicked, the dog would have been confused and not known what to do. So the two of them depended on each other. The two of them worked together as a team. At 8.50 a.m., four minutes after the explosion, not knowing the extent of the destruction above them, Michael and Rizal begin their terrifying descent from the 78th floor. We don't train our dogs, of course, to go down 78 flights of stairs. In, in crowded conditions and in scary conditions with all the smells and the, and the water, standing water and all of that. We don't train our dogs for that. We certainly don't train our dogs to help someone leave when their buildings are collapsing around them. We heard above us somebody shouting, there's a burn victim coming through, move to the side of the stairs. We stood there while a group passed us surrounding a woman who was very badly burned over most of her face and the upper part of her body. As more burn victims rush past them, the severity of their situation hits home. After the second group passed us, I think we just realized how bad it must be above us because a woman near us on the stairs then stopped and she said, I can't go on, I can't breathe, we're, we're, we're not gonna make it, we're, gonna, we're not gonna make it out of here. I can't go on, I can't go on, I'm not gonna get up. It's okay, you can do this. I can't do it, I can't do it, no. We just stopped and all surrounded her and literally had a group hug and said, come on, you can do this. After 20 minutes, Michael and Rizal have walked down 48 floors. But the inferno raging above them isn't their only concern. The heat from all the people in the stairwell is stifling, and the level of panic isn't helping. 
So we got to the bottom and I said, hop up also, which is a command to speed up or pay attention. Michael, Rizal, and David make it out to the street, just in time to discover that the second tower is also in jeopardy. Suddenly a police officer near us yelled, get the hell out of here, it's coming down. And we heard this rumble that literally within half a second became this deafening roar and it was tower two collapsing. Despite the chaos, Rizal remains calm and determined to lead her master to safety. For me, that was, was certainly the most panicky time. And I knew that if Roselle and I worked together, we would be OK. She stopped at the flight of stairs leading down into the Fulton Street subway station. She did exactly what she was supposed to do, and she just stood there and waited for a command. But Roselle is a true hero, and she belongs in that, in that hero status. And Michael does too. They both work together. For someone who's blind or vision impaired, a seeing eye dog is really their window to the world. For this relationship to work, it has to be built on a strong foundation of trust. This is why seeing eye dogs are one of the most widely screened service dogs in the world. After the tragic events of 9-11, Michael now dedicates himself to speaking about the importance of teamwork and trust in our professional and personal lives. In 2007, Roselle retired as a guide dog, though she continues to live with Michael and his wife as a cherished member of the family. She is not some old regular dog at all. She's a very special dog. Glenda Mosier and Michael Hinkson owe their lives to the dogs they work with every day. While these dogs are bred and trained for specific purposes, it's the close bond they share with their human masters that causes them to go above and beyond the call of duty.